Welcome to Somewhere to Believe in, a brand new podcast from Greenbelt Festival. If you're one of our thousands of Greenbelt regulars, then we hope this makes up for, well, partly, not spending four days in a field with us this summer. Or if you've never heard of or been to Greenbelt Festival before, then we hope our podcast might tickle your fancy too. Because this year, if we build it, you can't come. None of us can. Well, actually, six of us could, but we'd have to stay two metres apart and that doesn't really sound like a very good festival. Sounds more like a staff meeting in a field. Hello, I'm Catherine and I'm the programme manager at Greenbelt and one of your hosts of Somewhere to Believe In. Hello, I'm Paul and I'm the creative director at Greenbelt and your other host for this podcast. Greenbelt's about making space for arts, activism and belief to come together from around the world and hopefully change it for the better. It's about more than just four days in a field. It's a way of seeing and thinking and living. So if you love small talk and big ideas, this podcast is for you. Each week we'll be chatting to a brilliant guest and hopefully together we'll bring you some timely, maybe funny, provocative, uh, but above all hopeful thoughts and ideas to get us all through these strange times. We'll also be sharing our love of fields and festivals and communal gatherings. You remember those? and sharing what we're thinking of and doing here at Greenbelt to reimagine things for the new normal. We're calling our podcast Somewhere to Believe In because more than ever, we all need that right now and we really hope you enjoy it. So Catherine, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you Paul? I'm not bad. I'm not bad. I'm sitting in a really small little basement corner of a house that we've been building as a family for the last year. Um, and I've got a duvet sort of hanging up to my side. Um, I'm in the That's dark. Like. It's all very professional, very no professional. No fed. How about you? Are you working from home? I am. I'm working from home. Um, I live by myself in my little flat. And yeah, so I've made myself a little studio with duvets and mattresses too. It's the new normal. And and you you hadn't really long moved into your flat uh, before all this new world order kicked in, had you? No, I moved in in um, September. And before that, I've always lived with lots of other people um, in shared accommodation, um, And so this is the first time I had my own place and then they locked me down in it. The really bad thing though, isn't it? I mean, you and I have worked very closely together over the last five or six years making a festival, booking a festival programme. And I know that we we both love that. We feel passionate about it. It's something that we're very proud of and we feel really privileged to be involved in it. And that is just not part of our lives. That feels weird, doesn't it? Yeah. Paul, do you remember when... So we've been working all year to have this festival programme. We'd pretty much booked 80% of the festival. We had this beautiful artwork that we'd really worked hard. And we were a couple of weeks away from releasing that and telling the world what we'd been working on. And then we got we got stopped, didn't we? Stopped in our tracks. Yeah. And I don't think I've ever been as disappointed <laughs> I know that sounds really yeah. selfish to say, uh, given what the pandemic has meant for, for the global community, but I felt absolutely crestfallen. There's something about that making that you need to share it. It's not just something you can do and you think, oh, great, great. Oh, I'm really, yeah, that's been really rewarding. I think I've done something very worthwhile there. Until you can share it, it sort of doesn't mean anything. And so it felt like we would we were just cut off before the bit that really mattered. <laughs> don't know if you relate to that yeah my friend had to come around and have a beer with me and <laughs> chat through it and obviously you know it was for the it, we both know it was for the right reasons but in that first few days in that first week when we found out that we weren't going to be telling people because I think you know our audience they love the festival and whenever I'm booking stuff I want to try and make them proud i want to live up to how much they love this event and i really thought we got a good lineup this year (laughs) anyway one day 
hopefully next we'll get to year. share next, next year. year next year next year we've festival, kept it festivals have to come back i mean can you imagine a world without festivals the short answer is i cannot imagine a world without festivals i can't more broadly imagine a world where we're not allowed to enjoy that human contact which i think is just absolutely essential to our emotional and mental well-being and our spiritual well-being i can't imagine a world where those sorts of things are off the agenda how about you, Catherine? Can you imagine a world without festivals? Uh, yeah, I can imagine it. I, I wouldn't like it. To me, festivals are the slice of my year where I get to experience what I ideally, if I was in charge of everything, what I would have the world look like. I think it's a world where you get to mix with people that you don't normally get to mix with. We live our lives in such bubbles we've created such bubbles around ourselves that it's festivals are one of the only place where you get to mix with a whole variety of different people you get to be in nature you get to listen to music and watch theater and learn from speakers and authors you know diff- you spend some time learning about things that you wouldn't normally have time to sit and focus on i think that's a great description of, of of what a festival space can do and that's why I, I love being involved in Greenbelt because that's what we make we make that space that is like a little taster of how life could be we know that life can't be like a festival but why a fest- very good question All I've been trying things. to convince um, Paul and uh, the other directors that what we actually need to do is buy some land and we could all all the audience and volunteers and staff members all just go and live on it and make a new little world. Catherine, you sort of were born at the wrong time. It feels like you should have been born in the 1960s in America and been part of the Woodstock generation, do you think? I hear you, yeah. I mean, I've got the outfit. I think we all know that we've got some tough times ahead as a country and as a world, but the arts and culture section at the moment, at the time of this recording, have, haven't really been given a lot of support from the government in order to keep that industry alive. So I'm worried. Yeah, it feels like they've been forgotten, doesn't it? It feels mm-hmm. like they're the Cinderella of the piece and the whole focus is on NHS, quite rightly, the economy. There's a little bit of thought going into education now, but um, it feels like Uh, the arts are just being completely overlooked and i think that we're going to reap the whirlwind if if we lose our arts and culture from our lives i mean like creativity and imagination more generally if they get squeezed out then i think yeah i'm i'm out of here (laughs) you coming to my greenbelt island (laughs) i'm coming to your greenbelt island so that's where we are you know we've we've had this really strange summer and now we find ourselves on the verge of well this is the first episode of um releasing a podcast what's that all about i think you just wanted to find something for me to do if i didn't have a festival to buy. Uh, i mean have, you've never i've never uh, been involved in making a podcast before have you no so like, i this know is... that might be shocking because <laughs> this is going very well <laughs> you are coming across as the hard-working professional yeah i mean we've never done anything like this before so it's you know we'll have to see how it goes won't we to be honest if people just have it as background music i'd take that <laughs> yeah or you know if people are having really bad lockdown dreams and insomnia and they use this to go back to sleep with i'm fine with that too yeah maybe we should start speaking a bit softer <laughs> yeah Talking of that, our first guest for this episode is Roman Krasnarich, and he has got a beautiful voice, which makes you want to go into that sort of restful space. And Don't, uh, <laughs> because he's actually got some very interesting stuff. He has. Roman Krasnarich first came to our attention through the School of Life, where he was a founding faculty member. And there was a bunch of us at Greenbelt who thought, oh, the School of Life, we love what they do. 
Um, they were making philosophy um, accessible in the everyday. And Roman was one of their key writers and thinkers. And we invited him along to the festival. And we loved what he had to say. And he's been back several times since. He is a philosopher, but he's not like an academic or a dry philosopher. He's a philosopher who very much works and writes in the public space and with a view to making philosophy and philosophical ideas really accessible to people. So what better place to start than with someone who we count as a friend and who we think is incredibly interesting. Where are we speaking to you, Roman? Where are you right now? I am in Oxford, Oxford, UK, not Oxford, Mississippi, in my study in the garden. That looks like a brilliant study. I can just see walls and walls of books. Doesn't mean I've read them though. <laughs> Show books. <laughs> and how has how has lockdown been for you and your family? How has it affected your work and your your well being? You know, how has it been for you? Well, I've got eleven year old twins, so my partner and I I have had to become instant school teachers um, during lockdown, and that period just ended actually because the kids are in year six; they've just gone back to school, but during that time we were having to work of course and normal work because we can both work from home but at the same time trying to keep them entertained and in a way what we did is we let them lead the learning so they told us what they wanted to learn and then we tried to devise classes around it Um, and of course they wanted to learn all sorts of things from how to trampoline and do a double somersault you know to what would Mars be like in the year 2100 that sounds fantastic. I bet they didn't. They weren't interested in going back to school after that. Well, I think actually, yeah, when they go back to school, school for them is about community. Really, it's mm. about f- friends, and I think they're a little bit down on what they feel school can do to stimulate their brains. Um, but in fact, they learn a lot more than they really think. But I think they really enjoy the project-based learning. Yeah. Um, Oh, you're making me feel like a really bad parent, Roman. (laughs) (laughs) Have you just been letting them run wild, Paul? Yeah. We've been in the midst of trying to finish off building a house, and I've got four boys, Mm. and apart from the fact they just haven't got enough bandwidth or computer equipment for them to be learning online it it's just it's collapsed into it's pretty much upstairs for me now it's just a rogue state it's it's <laughs> completely out of control <laughs> well and i mean I, 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 um, yeah my kids were a lot of the time they were just fighting with each other and we couldn't think of great things to do but so i don't want to paint it as too much of a pretty picture of educational creative bliss <laughs> And you've been speaking at the festival for quite a long time off on and off now. And we, we like to count you as almost a festival friend. You know, we always know that Roman will come and you'll always have really interesting things to say. I just wondered, as a philosophy, what do you make of our audience? What do you make of our festival? Well, I think as a festival goes, it's unusually socially engaged. So if you compare it to speaking at a literary festival or something like that, you know, if you walk around Greenbelt, there's all sorts of talks that I want to go to um, about, you know, social justice or ecological justice. That's the kind of stuff that I'm into. And so that's what strikes me as the most uh, interesting thing. And I guess the second thing probably now I think about it is that if I recall the audiences when I've been speaking at Greenbelt, lots of sort of teenagers have been in the audiences more than I think would be at other sort of venues that I might speak at. And I think that's really interesting as well. Um, And obviously I have conversations with people after I give talks or people come up to you as you're wandering around. And so that's really energizing. So Roman, I just wanted to talk to you about how you first got into, got interested in philosophy. Yeah. How do you become a sort of philosopher is something I've wondered about over the years, because although I studied philosophy as an undergraduate, I actually went down the route of becoming a political scientist. So I have a PhD in political science. Um, And I actually then found being an academic, which I was for some years, completely maddening, partly because I was just writing articles which would be read by 10 other people, but partly because I was always interested in the big existential questions of life. how should we live, both as individuals and as citizens, as a society? And through that, I started trying to find ways of how do you sort of philosophize in, the, in public life? 
in the public sphere. And one of the first things that I did is I started working with a historian called Theodore Zeldin in an organization called the Oxford Muse, spelled M-U-S-E. And what we did is we brought people from different social backgrounds together, like a hundred CEOs and a hundred people with mental health issues or living on the streets and did these conversation meals where we gave them menus of conversation to talk about life. Like, what have you learned about the different varieties of love in your life or in what ways would you like to be more courageous? That for me was real grassroots philosophizing. That's getting people in everyday life to think about how to live and to share and try stepping into each other's shoes. And then the next experiment I did was working with an organization called the School of Life. And I was one of the founding faculty members of that. And it's now in 14 different countries. And the idea there was trying to, in a way, edit the best philosophical and psychological and other ideas from history and package them in a way to help answer the big questions of life, like how do I deal with relationship problems or how should I think about death? So these have been my kind of roots into trying to make philosophy something practical and useful and also political in a way. So when we knew that you were going to be one of our guests, uh, Roman, and um, you said that, why don't you go right the way back to my 2009 talk and look at what I was saying about empathy? Catherine had jumped in and you, Catherine, you'd listened to Roman's talk about um, the lost art of seizing the day, hadn't you? Yeah, I listened to the wrong talk. (laughs) And you got really excited. And then when you thought, oh, empathy, empathy, that that sounds, oh, empathy, that sounds, you you thought that might be a bit boring, but you were, yeah. No, I think we were talking about it. And I think that um, one of our colleagues was saying that this could be such a revolutionary idea. This could, this, this idea could be something that could show us where we've gone wrong in our society and help us on the way out. And I thought, oh, really? Empath-? Like, I wanted something practical. I wanted some science that we could do. And then as soon as I really started to listen to your talk, I thought, yeah, it's absolutely right. I was wrong. Like, this is, this is when you really start to think about empathy. Um, it could change everything. And it shows, I thought it highlighted a lot of the problems that we had in society, a lot of the divides that we had right now. Yeah, in fact, when I gave that talk at Greenbelt more than 10 years ago, at that time, I don't think there was a lot of public interest in the idea of empathy. Um, It wasn't something that I was ever, for example, asked to go on the radio to talk about or something like that. That's all changed in just one decade. And I think there's an increasing recognition that Empathy is um, something that is part of our emotional frameworks, our emotional scaffolding. We need it to understand ourselves or to get on with someone else in a relationship. If you're arguing with your partner, your husband, wife, whatever, sometimes, you know, you just think, stop and think to yourself, oh God, I wish they could just see where I'm coming from. I wish they could understand my point of view. Well, that's, you're asking for empathy or what's called cognitive empathy. You want them to step into your shoes, if only for a moment. But there's also the political side to it. I mean, I really believe that empathy has a revolutionary power and we it's been visible for more than 300 years ever since the first movements against slavery and the slave trade in Britain in the late 18th century which were empathic movements where the organizers of that those movements got former slaves to stand up and talk about their experiences so people could listen to what it was like to be whipped until you were unconscious on the ground what was it like to have a an instrument called a speculum oris, which is something put in your mouth to keep your jaw open so you could be force fed because so many of the slaves wanted to to, um, kill themselves basically and and, and not eat. Um, And this is about empathy, right? It's about trying to understand the voices we don't normally hear. Um, And I think this is partly what Black Lives Matter is about. You know, it's partly about trying to make sure that we recognize that our criminal justice systems are deeply unempathic. They are not recognizing the deep uh, prejudices built into them. And we need to unveil those. So shall we, um, shall we listen through to the, your, your introduction to empathy from way back in 2009? Can we, can we bear to do that together? And then we, can, then we can come back to it. Would that be okay? I can absolutely bear it. Let's see if I say anything vaguely sensible. (laughs) What does it mean to step into the shoes of another person and see the world from their point of view? What difference can it actually make to your own life? And if you want to do it, how do you go about doing it? How do you become an empathist? Well, this morning, I want to address some of those questions. And I want to... um, 
sort of suggest to you that empathy is a revolutionary guide for living in the 21st century, that it can become that for you and for society more broadly. Because empathy offers two things. One is that it can offer you a philosophy of living. It can be part of your personal art of living. But the other thing about empathy, which I think is not appreciated very often, is that it's a profound source of social change. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be delving a little bit into the psychology of empathy, into the history of empathy. Um, And, of course, you will also have a chance to um, discuss... Uh, your own empathetic imaginations with each other and to churn through some of the ideas for yourselves. Now, one of the strange things about empathy is that it has become an incredibly fashionable concept in the last uh, decade or so. Um, You know, why was empathy on the front page of the New York Times, in fact, multiple times over the last couple of months? Well, one of the reasons is because of this gentleman here. If you can't see the screen very well, there's Barack Obama. And One of the things that Obama has said in many of his speeches and his books countless times is that we seem to be suffering from an empathy deficit, our ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, um, to see the world through those who are different from us, whether it's the cleaner of your dorm room, as he said, or says, or an unemployed steel worker or whoever. He thinks that the greatest problem of modern society is the empathy deficit. It's the center of his moral, personal, and political vision. If you read his books, you'll see that there were these great moments of empathetic understanding in his life when he was a teenager, and he realized that he was basically being a nasty bastard to his grandfather and learned to empathize with him, um, and that this was sort of ripped him open into empathy and shifted his life and gave him a new vision uh, for living. And one of the, the reasons that empathy is Uh, as I said on the front page of the New York Times, is because Obama's been trying to put his ideas on empathy into political practice, so they're not mere words. For instance, he um, has you know, recently been trying to appoint successfully um, Sonia Sotomayor, the first Hispanic Supreme Court judge. And the reason there was controversy about that was that he said the reason she was the right person for the job was because she had empathy, and, you know, which derived from her, from her background. Um, And all the constitutional lawyers and Republicans were saying, well, you know, law is not about empathy. It's about about, um, being, you know, rational, um, about putting rules into practice. And Obama is saying, no, law is about real human beings. It's about being able to understand how they see the world. And you need empathy for that. And he's been successful in launching empathy onto the the agenda. Um, The problem with empathy, though, is that it's an incredibly slippery, often vague concept, and it's often confused with ideas like kindness and altruism and so on. So I want to be a little bit clearer about what empathy really means. Now, if you pick up a psychology textbook, you normally find two meanings of empathy. One of them is this. It's empathy as a shared emotional response. Now, you may not be able to see very well, but that's a picture of my son who's smiling there. And if you, too, are feeling a a sort of smile creep on your face or a bit of joy, then you're experiencing experiencing what's called effective empathy. That's empathy as a shared emotion or a mirrored emotion. So if you see a child who's you see joy in their face and you, too, feel joy, that's empathy. If you see anguish and you, too, feel anguish, that's empathy. It's mirroring their emotions. And that goes back to the original uh, uh, German word for empathy from which the English one is translated, which is the word Einfühlung, which means to feel into another person, to literally feel into them. And in 1909, that was translated into empathy in English. Um, so it's empathy is a shared emotional response. Now, empathy is different from sympathy. If you see a child in anguish and you feel not anguish but another emotion like pity, you think, oh, the poor little thing, you're experiencing sympathy. That's an emotional response which is different. It's not the same one. So empathy and sympathy are very, very different, though they're often confused. So this is one kind of empathy you find in the psychology textbooks. The other one is this, taking the perspective of others, cognitive empathy. What you can see there, if you can't see at the back, is um, a, uh, an adult who is in a room full of giant furniture. Now, this is from a, an architecture experiment in the 1950s in Nottingham where the students were asked to build furniture um, so that the room was how a child would see the room. So, you know, obviously a child will, you know, a bed will see, seem enormous or a chair will seem enormous. It's about taking the child's perspective. So this is the second kind of empathy. It's empathy as perspective taking. What that means is being able to understand where a person is coming from in terms of the, the views, beliefs, attitudes, 
uh, and experiences, emotional concerns which make up their worldview, how they see the world. So it's not about just about an emotional response. It's about stepping into their shoes and seeing how they look at life. And um, this is the kind of empathy that Barack Obama is uh, interested in. And it's the one that I'm interested in because this is the kind of empathy that you can develop and that I think can really um, shift the way you look at the world and open out your life into new kinds of adventures. And it's the kind of empathy we do absolutely every day. You may have a work colleague who's very nervous before giving a presentation or something, and you suddenly realize, oh, of course, he's new to the job. You empathize. You see it from his point of view. You understand why he's nervous about it. You may not ask him to do the presentation as a result. You may have a friend whose father just died, and you naturally ask yourself, well, what would it feel like to, to, to be her right now? What emotions would she be experiencing? You're empathizing in this cognitive sense. You're stepping into her shoes or into her mind. Or maybe you'll see a news article about uh, floods in Bangladesh where people have lost all their possessions. And you will try to imagine, you know, what is it like to have lost all your possessions like that person? There you are engaging in cognitive empathy. That's, you know, empathy as perspective taking. Now, there's another important way, or a distinction we have to make. And that's this, that since about 500 B.C., most of the world's major religions have come up with an idea called the golden rule, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, it's very important to point out that that is not empathy. Um, George Bernard Shaw understood the difference. He said, do not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. They might have different tastes. And what he was pointing out was that you know, empathy is harder than the golden rule because you have to not imagine yourself in another person's uh, Shoes. You have to imagine what it would be like to be them in their shoes, not you in their shoes. And of course, if you uh, happen to like surprise birthday parties and you throw a surprise birthday party for your colleague at the next desk at work, well, they may hate you forever for it because you know they don't like surprise birthday parties. You didn't put, them, you didn't imagine being them. You imagined being you, thinking that well, you'd like it, so they would too. And of course, that applies to the most fundamental moral issues of our time, where you know there are people who have very different views from us as well. But the question then we're left with is, okay, you've got this, this empathy, the, the cognitive empathy, perspective taking, stepping in someone else's shoes. Well, what difference does it really make? You know, how does it actually change us? We should start with the questions that we left that extract with, um, which is why, why is it important? Yeah, I mean, I think empathy is as important today as it ever was, perhaps even more so. And if you think about the context of coronavirus, here we are, on the one hand, we've seen an explosion of empathic action. People setting up WhatsApp groups on their local streets, community mutual aid groups, delivering food to uh, elderly people who find it difficult to live home or other vulnerable people. And that's extraordinary. That's happened in rich countries, poor countries all over the world. On the other hand, of course, the isolation of COVID-19 has meant we've been more separated from each other than at any time for, well, I can't even remember, maybe a century or more in terms of forced separation from people that we love. Um, and so that, of course, is a barrier to empathic understanding on some level. And then there's other dimensions to it because we know we've been situated within our households, with our families, and in some ways that can be a wonderful thing and full of empathic uh, new kinds of understanding my kids have actually become friends my twins for some mad reason but at the same time all across the world we've seen explosions of domestic violence um, so this particular historical context i think is one that makes us think a lot about empathy um, and its potential impacts it feels like um that empathy hasn't made the sort of impact that it that we might have hoped it it did at that that political policy making level and also it feels we might have even become more tribal and more divided in some ways in our social media bubbles in our culture wars um and this this art of perspective taking we we seem to have lost it somehow do you does that make you despair, Roman, or, or, or do you think we can still get it back? Or is it? The, am I telling the truth? Is it the case that we've lost it, or is it still there somehow? I think that empathy is 
waxing and waning in different places in different parts of the world all at the same time and has been going on since I gave that talk. On the one hand, there have been enormous strides being made. So, for example, in the educational field, empathy has become a part of mainstream education in many places. So, for example, the International Baccalaureate's primary schools program has empathy at the heart of it. So if you're 10 years old or 11 years old and you, you go to school, you, your whole first term will be about shaped around the topics of empathy and tolerance and respect. That's how you learn maths and geography and so on. Equally, we've seen social movements emerging which have very strong empathic aspects to them. The gay rights movement in the last decade has flowered in many parts of the world. Struggles for indigenous rights against racial injustice. So that's the sort of the good side of it. But as you say, the cracks have been appearing. I think partly because our economies are burning out on the sense that we can't keep growing and growing and growing. And one of the things we've seen is multiple financial crisis like in 2008 and now the instigation of long-term unemployment. Well, what does that do? Long-term unemployment tends to breed tribalism. People start blaming others. So you've got the rise of the far right across Europe, particularly in Eastern Europe and other places as well. And we felt in the UK, you see it in the US, those are real manifestations of it. Um, and I think so any societies under strain, empathy becomes a more distant goal, but becomes even more important. I mean, this is what Greta Thunberg's been about in a way in the climate activists. She's constantly trying to invoke the idea of empathy and trying to imagine, you know, if you care about children, well, think about children. What are their lives going to be like? What's my life going to be like, she says, in the year 2075? How am I going to look back at my own children if I have children? And this is, that is a bridge, really, to something that increasingly interests me, which is empathy, shifting from empathy across space to thinking about empathy through time. You know, mm. So how do we empathize, not just with people on the social margins today in today's world, but with future generations? Because there's more of them than there are of us, you know? An estimated 100 billion people have been born and died in human history in the last 50,000 years. Well, over the next 50,000 years, if this century's birth rate remains constant, nearly 7 trillion people will be born. Um, and so that far outweighs everyone who's ever alive today or been alive in the last 50,000 years. And that's extraordinary. And certainly one of the reasons I've been thinking about this a lot is because I started this art project a few years ago called the Empathy Museum, which travels around the world and gives people a chance to step into the shoes of others. And one of its main exhibits is something called A Mile in My Shoes. And you can walk inside it and you can put on the pair of shoes belonging to a stranger, like someone who's been in prison for 14 years or a Syrian refugee or a Brazilian sex worker. And then you can literally walk a mile in their shoes while listening to an audio narrative of them talking about their life. And it's very powerful, it's very moving. But what it made me think about is, well, okay, we can step in the shoes of people today, but how do we step into the shoes of people 100 years from now when we can't put on their shoes, we can't hear their stories? That's a much harder task. Well, I think that kind of leads us into um, w the work that you're doing at the moment. So you've got a new book um, that has just come out at the moment. Uh, it's called The Good Ancestor, and it's all about thinking long-term in a short-term world. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? So that is a book which asks a question which was first asked, as far as I know, by the immunologist Jonas Salk. He was the guy with, with his team um, discovered the polio vaccine in 1955. He said, the great question of our time is this, how can we be good ancestors? In other words, how are we going to be remembered by future generations? And he believed that if we were going to be remembered well, and if we're going to deal with the great long-term challenges of our time, our destruction of the natural world, our putting deadly technologies into the world like you know nuclear weapons and so on, if we're going to deal with that, we'd have to expand our time horizon. So instead of thinking on a scale of seconds and minutes and hours, we need to be thinking on a scale of decades and centuries and even millennia. And so there's this great task, uh, which is what I've been trying to explore in the book, which is how can we expand our time horizons? How can we escape the tyranny of the now? Because we all know that we're constantly looking at our phones, we're buying fast food, we're pressing the buy now button, and nations are sitting around international conference tables bickering away while the planet burns and species disappear. And we know that they're not planning for the next pandemic on the horizon. And those countries that did like Taiwan have dealt very effectively with um, the epidemic and countries like the US, which haven't planned, 
have suffered as a result. So that's what this book is about. That's where it's coming from. One of the keys to this, I think, is the concept of legacy. Trying to think about how we want to be remembered. And most human beings, particularly once they reach middle age, a lot of psychology research on this, shows that they tend to start thinking about how they're going to be remembered when they're gone, how to keep the fire of their life burning beyond death. And some people go down a very egoistic route of thinking about legacy, like a Russian oligarch who wants a wing of the National Gallery named after them. That's how they're going to live forever. Some people focus on, a, understandably, a very familial form of legacy, so wanting to leave things to their kids, property, or, or, or pass on family traditions, um, rituals, religion to their children and grandchildren. But I think if we're going to be good ancestors, we need what I think of as a transcendent sense of legacy. We have to be caring about the universal strangers of the future. We've got to make a leap to something bigger, to those generations who we will never meet. My initial feeling is that I'm not important enough to be remembered. So um, what, why would anything I do really have any effect? OK, so there's a question there about agency. And I think, I think a lot of people sort of feel what difference can I make in the world, whether it's the world today or the world a hundred years from now? And that can be very disempowering. Mm. I came across this really interesting statistic the other day that people who know someone who stopped flying because of climate change, 50% of them fly less as a result. In other words, there's a contagion effect for certain kinds of actions. So I think if you're interested in intergenerational justice, like I am, um, as well as justice today too, then we need to think about what can we do as individuals which have this amplifying effect. It's a bit like having solar panels on your roof and you, you get them and then your neighbours start getting them as well. Um, that's kind of how it works. But I think we can all be part of movements for change, even knowing that we're just one drop because lots of drops, of course, make a wave. Um, that's what my kids were doing before the lockdown happened when they were going on the uh, climate marches, you know, with uh, other school students around the country and around the world. And there are really important long-term movements emerging today. So, for example, you know, you may know, know that in Wales, there's a Future Generations Commissioner. Uh, it's a public position. And the, the commissioner's job is to look at the impact of um, legislation on people 30 years from now. So it's not super long-term, but quite long-term. And there's a campaign for the UK to have a Future Generations Commissioner as well. And I'm supporting that campaign, and that's something anyone can support. It's called Today for Tomorrow. So I think we can all play a part in these. And, you know, maybe it's something as small also of getting in touch with the future through going on holidays with your children and looking for fossils and getting in touch with a sense of deep time to recognize that here we are as just a, an eye blink, humankind, an eye blink in the great history of life going back at least 3.8 billion years to the beginning of life on Earth and stretching possibly billions of years to the death of our sun. And who are we to put it all in jeopardy with our ecological blindness and deadly technologies? Um, and recognizing ourselves as part of a long expanse of time, I think, is one of those ways of um, challenging our obsession with the now. You use this word transcendental, sort of connecting with this transcendental concern for the bigger picture, for the longer now, for the for the for the bigger here. Yeah, are you are you hopeful, Roman, that that enough people will get that that wider sense for us to be able to make a difference? I believe in hope and not optimism. So I'm not optimistic in the sense of I'm not a half glass full person about this thinking it's all going to be okay, you know, because I think that's a kind of attitude that can breed complacency. I'm hopeful in the sense that I believe this is a huge and big struggle for humankind to shift our temporal thinking, starting to think long term. But I think hope is all about grabbing onto something you believe in, even if it's against the odds. And I'm hopeful in the sense of for example, you're talking about, you know, environmental organizations and that kind of thing. Those organizations have long termism built at the heart of them in a way. I mean, if you think of the last half century, hundreds of thousands of environmental movements have emerged around the world and they all have something in common, which is they all have a worship of the planet. 
as a sacred object, however it's created. Um, and they may not have that written into their mission statements, but that kind of recognition of the sacredness of the planet and life on Earth is something I think that galvanizes and motivates a lot of people. And we're starting to see it in very clear public policy today. So, for example, the city of Amsterdam has recently adopted the model of donor economics, the economist Kate Raworth's donor economics model, um, as a way for it to get out of the COVID-19 crisis, but also for creating a long-term regenerative economy. So that Amsterdam's ambition is by 2050, they'll be 100% regenerative. In other words, they won't have any kind of excess wastes. By 2030, there'll be no fossil fuel cars there. So we see these places of hope, but of course that is not going on all over the world. And I think a lot of the hope lies in cities and people organizing in cities. I've kind of given up on nations in some ways, um, partly because nations aren't very good at dealing with the big long-term problems of our time, like the climate, like migration, like inequalities. But I think actually cities are showing themselves as being particularly innovative. And I think they're going to be innovative in these terms of intergenerational justice uh, aspects as well. And I guess you don't need everybody to, uh, to do that long-term thinking. You just need enough people to do that action. Well, there's this famous statistic in social movement studies that you need like something like 3.5% of people to back your movement if you're going to be successful. Now, I don't actually believe that statistic itself, but certainly change tends to come from small groups of highly motivated people. But what's really interesting about intergenerational justice and this long-term thinking is that it's not who you would expect to be uh, are the people who are behind the great time rebel movements. Because sometimes people say to me, oh, isn't long-term thinking that's something for um, middle-class people or people with means, whereas those people who are just trying to get by are focused on the here and now. They can't think long-term. But I almost think it's the other way around, that often it's the the privileged aristocrat who has a very narrow sense of legacy for the future, just wanting to pass down the manor house to their children. But it's often those at the, on the social margins who are stru struggling hardest for intergenerational justice. You see it, for example, amongst Native American peoples, like the Iroquois idea of seventh generation thinking. This is not a privileged group in society, but it's a, an ethic of ecological stewardship. You find amongst Maori people and the idea, the Maori concept of whakapapa, which is the idea of genealogy, the idea that we're connected between the present and the past and the future, that while I'm sitting here in this room talking to you, the dead, the living and the unborn are all here with me. Um, and of course, you see it in the current movement going on around into, um, racial justice. So there's the um, activist, racial justice activist Leila Saad's written an excellent book called Me and White Supremacy. On the first page, she talks about being a good ancestor. It's a recognition that that racial justice is not just an issue of the present, but one of the past. It's deeply embedded in political, cultural, criminal justice uh, systems and so on. And it's a lot, it's going to be embedded for many generations in the future unless we do something about it. So we're almost at the end of our time, Roman. We obviously want to point people to your book. Where's the best place for them to get hold of The Good Ancestor? Well, you can get it from your local friendly independent bookshop. Uh, and if you go online, there's a great website called Hive. For anyone who doesn't know that, that's a really great place to buy books today. You can go to your other online retailers as well. I don't have to mention them by name, but I think ultimately you can also try and connect with the great long-term thinking uh, organizations that you might know about. Think about your church and trying to give talk to your people in your church about how, what it would look like to have a 100-year plan to go to your workplace, what it would mean to put solar panels on the roof or make it regenerative, and to think about your family. Can we go on a visit to an ancient tree once a month that's a 1,000 years old and get in touch a little bit with deep time? So those are the sort of things you would recommend. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Roman. It's been brilliant chatting. Yeah, really inspiring. Really interesting. <laughs> That was amazing. What what did you think of that conversation around empathy? Oh, I love chatting to Roman. I just think he's so generous with the way he describes stuff and just made it so simple and easy for me to understand. 
Yeah, he's got that knack, hasn't he? And someone once said to me when I was much, much younger that if you can express something that simply, it's because you you understand it really, really profoundly yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think he's got that knack. What did you think about that that bit where he was talking about how some activities are actually contagious? That, that you can, if you see someone behaving in a certain way or doing something, you can almost sort of catch that. What did you think of that idea? I like that. I think it's true. Like, I, I'm not one of those... I have a hard time when people tell me to do stuff, I have a hard time doing it. You know, if people are like, oh, you should watch this film, you should watch this film, then generally I don't go and watch it. I Just the way my brain is wired. But I do learn from other people's example. And I think that's what he was saying, basically, wasn't it? And, and it also makes you feel like your actions are worth something. Your actions can be important, no matter how small they are. Yeah, because you'd asked him that question, hadn't you? You said, look... I don't feel like I matter that much or that what I do can make a difference. But but spinning it around that way into the idea that what you're doing can be contagious gives you more of a sense of agency, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So how can we start this um, empathy pandemic that will save the world? Yeah, really good question. I, I, th I think it's about changing our own behaviours uh, or developing our own behaviours in the hope that the way that we then treat others will have a ripple effect. What do, you, what do you think? Well, I think that one of the first steps that would be good, this is what I would decree in the Greenbelt world. Yeah, um, in your field. In my green, yeah, my Greenbelt field of life. Yeah. We, I think we need to become more vulnerable. I think we need to open ourselves up to being vulnerable. And I think that's, that would help us step into being empathetic. And being able to feel and understand somebody's point of view that's not our own. Um, but it's a really hard world to be vulnerable in. And, and, and vulnerability is seen as a, as a real weakness, isn't it, often? Yeah. Well, I was thinking about why people struggle to be empathetic. And I think that you, first of all, need to face the fact that your view of life is not the only one. And it may even be wrong. You need to open yourself up to being changed. You need to open yourself up to maybe things that you find upsetting and sad and distressing. You need to open yourself up to the fact that this world might be not as rosy as you think or would like it to be as not as comforting as you would like it to be and I think all of those things need you to be vulnerable to do that you know I think we walk around a lot of people walk around with this armor that they've built up from going through life you know this is my view and it's correct and I find comfort in that and stability in that and these are my friends and this is the way I view the world and this is the way I live the world. And as long as I keep doing this, then everything is fine. One thing that really struck me uh, about Roman and his, his take on empathy was he was being very clear that it's not necessarily something that um, it doesn't equate to the golden rules of religion. Like um, I was brought up going to church by Christian grandparents and you, I'd be tempted to think that, oh, you know, just by doing that and just by being part of that particular version of the truth, that story, that Christian story, then I would understand. I would just be naturally empathetic, wouldn't I? But I think that Roman was saying that actually to be empathetic is, is harder work than just the golden rule, which is do unto others as you would have them do, uh, you know, behave towards you. That's in a sense the bare minimum. Whereas I think empathy takes us that step beyond that golden rule of, you know, treat others as you want to be treated. It goes one step further. And that's why it starts to make or could make a real, real difference. <laughs> When Roman last came to Greenbelt, I think it was 2017, he was talking about the lost art of seizing the day, a carpe diem. And yet now he was talking to us in that conversation about the tyranny of the now. Did, did, that, did that strike you? I don't know. I feel like I'm the opposite, Paul. Really? I feel like, yeah, I feel like okay. um, I need... This is probably why I've loved lockdown so much is because I haven't really been able to think about the future. I've just been like, sleep, eat read, react, repeat. <laughs> Whereas normally I'm like, you know, am I going to have a family in the future? Am I going to be able to 
I don't know, afford a holiday? Am I going to be able to, am I going to have a job in, you know, a few years? Am I, what, what's going to happen? Am I going to be able to look after my parents? Am I going to, ah! So for you, living in the moment has actually been a real release from those longer term worries and anxieties. Yeah. I think perhaps what he was saying was more than on the individual level. Perhaps he was saying on a societal level, on a governmental level, why is it that we're obsessed with this sort of short termism? I think perhaps that's what he's saying is that we're trapped into this cycle of one short term thing after another when we need to be thinking much, much longer term in terms of hundreds and perhaps even thousands of years. It's quite an interesting idea, isn't it? Yeah, I think that in order to think longer term, you need to care about the longer term. So you need to care about the world and you need to care about the future and you need to care about the legacy of humanity and you need to care about your grandkids and your grandkids' grandkids. We've got so much other stuff that we need to care about that's immediate that 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 gets lost like how are you supposed to care about your grandkids 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 when you haven't got stable income or you haven't got stable housing you know it, that's it's that's tough <laughs> Roman was um, he was he was very excited about the the possibility of cities providing models of hope and innovation and ways forward for us rather than at nation states. He was thinking that cities might be where it's happening, you know, like Amsterdam adopting donor economics. But then I and I thought, Catherine, you know, what about festivals? Could festivals like we were saying at the very beginning, could they provide a way forward, a, a place of hope? I don't know, because they only happen for four days. I think yeah. if a festival lasted for a few months, then maybe. It's interesting to think whether cities could do it, because, yeah, I, I've followed that Amsterdam has taken up donut economics as a way of getting out this pandemic. But I always thought that change needed to come from a government level. But I think that the one thing that a city has got is that tremendous diversity and energy in it because of the sheer amount of different types of people who live in it. And I think perhaps there's something in that energy, in that diversity that can produce innovation and hopefulness in a way that other settings perhaps can't. If anybody's got some good examples of where that started to happen, I would love to hear about that. We would. Roman sounded quite hopeful, didn't he? Yeah, so I'm worried that actually what we've been talking about is making it less hopeful because I remember at the end of the conversation leaving that and feeling very hopeful about the future. Yeah, me too. I think that, you know, hopefully people will listen to more than one episode and I think they'll find that all of the guests that we're going to be speaking to really, really have a real strong sense of hopefulness about them. And Roman was exactly the same. He really was. He sounded very reasonable and very, very hopeful. I, I found that really encouraging, really inspirational. Rare the, as well. Yeah, it feels rare, doesn't it? It, it does feels feel rare. rare. <laughs> I guess you have to. I guess you have to live in hope in order to make any change. If you don't live in hope, then you're just giving up, and nothing's going to be done. So even if you think that the outcome is unfavourable to you, you still have to live in hope in order for there to be any small chance of change. We'll put loads of links up to um, Roman's books, uh, to his website, uh, and where you can find out a lot more about his work uh, alongside the podcast. So if you missed stuff, in the conversation don't worry there's there'll be links that you can follow uh, online so that's it from us uh, we really hope you've enjoyed listening to the first episode of the somewhere to believe in podcast uh, and obviously we'd love to know what you think so if you've got any questions or comments please go on any of our social media platforms and we've also got an email set up that you can email into us haven't we paul stbi at greenbelt dot org dot uk stbi at greenbelt dot org dot uk and we'll read your emails and who knows we might read out some of those emails in future episodes oh like a proper podcast oh yeah and we really hope that you'll be back with us next week for our episode two when we'll be talking to amanda cozy mcquashy the ceo of christian aid about how on earth you run a multinational ngo when there's a global pandemic going on <laughs> Thank you.
We've got a few thank yous. We want to thank uh, Rem Krasnarich for being our first guest and for being so lovely to talk to and kind to us while we found our feet. Uh, we want to thank Daisy on the staff team for producing these podcasts and for keeping us on the straight and narrow. Daisy started work on the staff team two days before lockdown. Well done, Daisy. You've been amazing. We'd also like to thank our Recorded Talks volunteer team in this strange summer where we're not getting to put on a festival together and work with our hundreds and hundreds of fantastic volunteers. It's been great to be able to work with our Recorded Talks team on getting this podcast out to you. Thank you to all those involved and especially to Kat and Josh for all their edits. We'd also like to say a really, really massive thank you to Lee Baines of the band Lee Baines the Third and the Glory Fires from Alabama in the States. We're using one of their songs, which is I Can Change, as the, uh, the music and the soundtrack for this podcast with Lee's permission, of course. We'd also like to thank uh, Paul Truman, who works with us. He's a mad podcast aficionado and he's helped us um, get these episodes out of the door. So thanks very much. We recorded this podcast before the government announced its 1.5 billion rescue package for the arts and cultural sector. We really, really welcome this news, of course. The devil will be in the detail, and of course there's still no specific details in there about any support for the festival sector itself. Uh, that's something we're still waiting for with bated breath, alongside many, many other festivals up and down the country.